Okay, let us then tonight briefly look at how he delivered us. Because delivered us, he did. I'm going to read to you as I continue through the chapter 53 in particular. When we get there, we, we are, as many, many do when they speak on this subject or, or read, they would uh, include um, Isaiah chapter 52, 13 onwards. It is the context, behold my servant is really where we have started. So I'm going to start there. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, and then we're going to read the whole chapter of Isaiah chapter 53, a passage which without doubt amongst you here tonight, as I look around, will be familiar, it will have been well read, it will be that which we know is the gospel. I think as I've opened up, as I introduced this, it was Augustine who said this was the fifth gospel. This is, this is imperative to our Christian life. This is where everything hangs. And it's one thing that... Um, for sure that we know, and our experience in Israel is that chapter 53 to the Jews is not read, it's ignored, it's too much for them. There's a good interview, actually, I would recommend watching, and um, you might have seen it. You might, have you heard of Ben Shapiro? Yeah. Ben Shapiro and John MacArthur. John MacArthur argues this point of uh, Isaiah 53 to a Jew. <sighs> really interesting. Have a, have a look. Um, really interesting. To, to learn from and just to see, you know, because there's no doubt about it, the Jewish people have a knowledge, but they still have the veil mm. on their eyes. And tonight I pray for each and every one of us, or, or as, as Paul, in the end of Romans chapter 2, I trust, tells us that the real Jew is one that is circumcised of heart. Yes. that knows the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. So let us read this, and then I'm going to make a few comments on chapters 14, uh, sorry, forgive me, verses 14 and 15, before then next time we enter into chapter 53. Okay, here goes. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be... Extol, exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations, the kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. <coughs> Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5, he was wounded, but he was wounded. For our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Listen to this, folks. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is done. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. 
And he made himself, sorry, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall prolong, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge, shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. What a chapter. So we looked over the last two or three weeks when I have stood here on a Sunday night and shared. We started in verse 13, as I've already mentioned to you, of chapter 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be made very high. This verse is about his exaltation, the exaltation of Christ. He will be higher and lifted up. He goes on to say that he will deal prudently, or as we went through, or wisely. Let me say to you tonight, very quickly, that which he came to do, he will do. That which he came to do will be achieved. That's what's being stated here by the prophet Isaiah. I think the word there, prudently or wisely in the Hebrew gives the, um, the word there gives the, the uh, understanding of success. Success. This will be successful. What Christ came to do, what Christ came to achieve, will be successful. And let me say to you tonight, it does not depend upon our will, but upon the will of God. It will be completely done. That is why we can say, it is finished. It will be accomplished. The cross of Christ will not fail in any way. No way. Because of this, because of that, he will be exalted. He shall be made very high. He shall and is sitting right now at the right hand of his Father, <coughs> reigning. The angels worship him. Read the book of Revelation. <coughs> Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is him that was slain. That is where he belongs. That is what here we are reading. He shall be made very high. It says in, a, in the book, uh, the letter to the Philippians, every knee shall bow. And then he goes on to say, this is where we left off. <coughs> not only in heaven, not only on the earth, but under the earth, every knee will bow to the glory of God the Father. He will be exalted. He will be made <coughs> high, for he is higher. His name is higher than any other. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. I think it says in the book of Revelation that it was written on his thigh. He shall be extolled. There's no doubt in that. So there we have seen his exhortation. <coughs> but we go on and we move on to something which the, uh, the prophet Isaiah begins to introduce 
That's why these three verses have to be in the context of chapter 53. Because as we've just read, chapter 53 is a description of his death. A description of how it will come to pass. A description of why. And a description of the results of it. And that's what we're going to learn as we go through this. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And he shall see the travail of his soul. <coughs> this will justify many. That's what we read. So as we turn to verse 14, it says this. And this is his humiliation. This now is his humiliation. If you know the scriptures, you will know that it says in Galatians, referring to that of the Old Testament, Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. If you want to get into study, read a book by John Stott on the cross of Christ. When we had that great opportunity from the goodness of yourselves to go into Israel, they describe some of the brutality. They point things out. I want to say to you tonight, church, this happened. The man Christ Jesus was crucified in a brutal way, in a horrific way, which is laid out here in the scriptures. I have heard it said that it doesn't say much about it. I think that is wrong. I think it is here. It is prophesied of the brutality of the death of our Lord and our Saviour. This was humiliation. Total humiliation. If you are familiar with the Gospels, you will see that. It says in the account of Matthew that people walked on by and wagged their heads. And if you are going to get involved in open air work, let's not romanticise it. Same as today. You speak of Christ and people wag their heads in scorn and reproach and in laughter. That's the reality. But it says, does it not, that he was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. His visage was so marred more than any man. His visage, I want to say to you tonight, was his face. His face and his form was his body. We read in Psalm 22, 14, in this prophetic statement. Psalm 22, 14 says this. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not an emotional film that we're talking about. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, to whom we have just celebrated. He dwelt amongst us. He was born in the likeness of man. Now this man, we are hearing a description of his brutality, the brutality of his death. My strength, verse 15 of Psalm 22, is dried up. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Like a pot shed, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Remember the account? They offered him vinegar. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I, t I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. That there, if you look at any good commentary, will tell you that is the exhaustion of the body. The utter exhaustion of the body of sitting and s or standing on a cross in the heat of the day. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. As you all know, the soldiers there made sport of him and mocked him. 
and ridicule him. Marred, that word marred there means to be disfigured. <coughs> disfigured. Corruption. The language here that is used carries a sense of horrific brutality. Horrific brutality. Chapter 53 goes on to say such things. In verse 5, we see wounded. Verse 4, afflicted. Verse 5 again, bruised like a lamb that is led to what? The slaughter. Crushed and bruised. These things have not been hidden from them, from us. But in reality, the scriptures tell us what happened. We read, don't we, in the Gospels again, a crown of thorns was placed upon his head. Slapped and punched and spat upon. Before being handed over to be crucified, he was whipped. This was the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he was, as you know, brutally nailed to a cross. How many times have we read through these things? How many times have we maybe preached on these things or heard these things preached upon? Or should we just glide over them? I don't think so. I think we must consider them. The reality of the incarnate Son of God is that he was utterly disfigured to a point of being unrecognised. The silly pictures that we see, that's why they're an abomination. Doesn't, doesn't give any credence or credit at all. This God, this Christ, was butchered. If you like, the spotless, unblemished Lamb of God became blemished. I'll say that again because this is the crucial point. The spotless, unblemished Lamb of God. You've read through Leviticus. You've read parts of Exodus. You've read through Numbers. You, what you will hear through that, those terminologies there, you will see it. It must be what? An unblemished lamb. Spotless. Speaks of the things in the tabernacle, the pure linen. Pure. It's all signifying the purity of Christ. Yet he became unblemished. So we can and should mention and reflect as the prophet Isaiah encourages us to, helps us to reflect on the brutality of the cross. But we have to ask ourselves as we go deeper what really is happening here. What is happening here? The substitutionary death is taking place. The atonement is taking place. The Lamb is being put on the mercy seat. God is dealing with sin. And only He could be the one who deals with it. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says this, For He hath made Him, God hath made Him, the Son, Christ, to <coughs> be sin for us. That's what's happening here. But He goes on, Paul goes on in this description, who knew no sin, who knew no sin. And we see this echoed and repeated through the chapter 53 of Isaiah, that we might be made the righteousness of God. That's what's <coughs> taking place here, that you and I can be made the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. This is, if you like, 
in the theologian's world would be probably be called double imputation. He has had our sin imparted, if you like, onto him. And while that was taking place, those, as we read Romans 4, were being justified. You were having his righteousness. You were being clothed from on high. The robe of righteousness. Our sin was put upon him. That's what this brutality is about. He took the punishment for you and me. And if we believe upon him, his righteousness, as I've already mentioned, is put into your account. Read Romans 4, 5. When was it that Abraham was declared righteous, if you like? Was it before or after circumcision? We know that it was before. Why? Because he believed. Hallelujah. Because he believed. He knew, you know, I would love to go on. Abraham knew the promise of the coming Christ. That's what he believed in, by the way. How was Abraham justified? By believing in the coming of the Christ. Not under the old covenant was he justified. He was justified, like you and me, in the blood of Christ. Because he believed the promise of God. Read Romans 4. He believed the promise of God. So we claimed and called upon Christ. Yes. Wonderful. That's how Abraham was justified. And I say to you tonight, it is the same way to which you and I yes. are made righteous. By believing yes. upon the complete, redemptive, atoning work of Jesus Christ. What we read here as we come to an end. What we read here in Isaiah 40, uh, 52, 14. This is true and I trust you will hear it. He's an angry God. An angry God. Rightfully. Pouring out his wrath on his son. For, his, for our sin. Yet equally and harmoniously. It was the same Time. It was God at the same time, lovingly. God pouring out and giving of his son to save his people. We sang it. Mercy, justice and mercy kiss each other. Do you see that? It is crucial for you tonight to understand what is happening here. Judgment and mercy. What we see here tonight as we talk of these things is a righteous God. Rightfully dealing with sin, yet lovingly making a way for his people. If you've heard any of the work we try and do in the open air, we often, in fact I, every time, said that there was a court, and the judge, the man is guilty, you're guilty. No question about that, we're guilty. All of sin is one shot, the glory of God. So that judge committed a heinous crime. <coughs> Evidence is all against you. And the judge said, well, I'm a God of love, I'll let him off. I'll tell you, you would cry with me. And the newspapers would report it. We would cry in justice. God would not be God if he did not judge sin righteously. He has to judge it. He will not go against his character. Had to judge and punish sin. Why? Because he's righteous and he is holy. <coughs> but in all the while, as I've already said, this was the greatest love that could ever happen. But he poured out his mercy upon us through this great act of the cross as we move forward and as we do come to a finish these three verses before we go into the actual chapter of 
53. I just want to focus on the first line of verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Again, if you are readers of the Old Testament, you will hear things like this being read in Exodus 24, verse 8. Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. There was sprinkling, it sprinkled, it covered the altar, it covered everything. There was blood being sprinkled. And the people, the people sprinkled. People sprinkled with blood of the covenant, the blood that puts the covenant into effect. The blood signifies the cleansing from sin. Blood signifies the cleansing of sin so that the people might enter into a covenant relationship. That's what's being said here. Just like the Passover. Exactly the same thing. The blood is on the doorposts and the lintels of your house. And the angel has to pass over. No power. The effect of the cross, the effect of the blood as we share in it on a Sunday morning and a Monday night, this is the effect. It's about a covenant that's been made and it shall sprinkle many nations. Christ the priest has now offered the sacrifice unto God, which is himself. He is the priest and he is the sacrifice. Now the blood of the sacrifice is being applied to many nations. Not only the Jews, not only those of the house of Israel, but many nations will come and become part of this new covenant. Already here we see a prophetic statement being made. Jesus said, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. John, as we're going to look at in a few weeks in the uh, letter of 1 John, Jesus Christ died not only for our sins, not only the Jews, not only the nation of Israel, but now it is declared but for the sins of the whole world. That means tonight, wherever you're from, circumcised or uncircumcised, that's the issue. You can come boldly Hallelujah. in the blood to the throne of grace. Jesus Christ died not only for the sins of Israel, for the whole world. We will look at that in a few weeks as we deal with 1 John, but that was confirmed on the day of Pentecost. But this gospel now goes out to the whole world. This blood is sufficient. And it purchases your salvation. Let me read this to finish. We believe that Jesus Christ is ordained with an oath to be an everlasting high priest after the order of Melchizedek and that he hath presented himself in our behalf before the Father to appease his wrath by his full satisfaction. It pleased him by offering himself on the tree of the cross and pouring out his precious blood to purge away our sins. As the prophets had foretold, for it is written, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He was brought as a lamb unto the slaughter, and numbered with the transgressors. And condemned by Pontius Pilate as a male factor, though he had first declared him innocent. Therefore, he restored that which was took away, and suffered the just for the unjust, as well in his body as in his soul, 
feeling the terrible punishment which our sins had merited, insomuch that his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. He was called out, he called out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I've suffered all this for the remission of our sins. Wherefore we justly say with the Apostle Paul that we know nothing but Christ and him crucified. We count all things but lost and done, done for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose wounds we find all manner of consolation. Neither is it necessary to seek or invent any other means of being reconciled to God than this only sacrifice, once offered, by which believers are made perfect forever. This is also the reason why he was called by the angels of God, Jesus, that is to say, Saviour, because he should save his people from their sins. What a gospel. I want to confess to you tonight, intellectually I can't grasp this, but by faith I believe it. So tonight we finish with Isaiah 53 verse 1. And we ask ourselves this, and I ask this of you tonight. Who has believed our report? Have you tonight believed this? Yes. May I trust it be so. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we come to you. <coughs> we can only come to you in an act of praise and of worship for all that you have done. What good news. We say it so often, the gospel is good news. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide, through the floodgates of God's mercy flow the vast and gracious tide. Grace, yes, and love like mighty rivers, poured incessant from above, Heaven's peace and perfect justice kiss the guilty world in love. Father, tonight, we thank you for your redeeming act. Father, I ask that you'll give us great understanding of it, great knowledge of it, not just in our heads, but far more than that, in our hearts. And tonight, if we're in the Lord Jesus, we can walk from this place with peace which surpasses all understand. Oh, that your name would be appraised amongst us. I ask, Lord, that you'll bless your people. We thank you for your precious word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, who has come and been the paraclete, the comforter, and applied it to our hearts. For we confess to that, Lord, that salvation is of God and of God alone. In the name of Jesus. Amen.